and setting intentions. And I'll have a playback that no one else will hear but me. Um, so I'm just going to keep <laughs> talking for a second. Um, I'm really happy everyone's here today. And, it, and I actually kind of like this later evening session because I'm like, oh, this is just what we're doing this evening, right? We're kind of hanging out and it's nice to see everyone. And Brian is right. We can eat breakfast tacos all day long. Uh, we definitely do that here in Texas. We eat them all day long. Um, so quick intro and then we'll just go ahead and jump in. I don't want to be too long in the intro, uh, but I did want to just some housekeeping things. If you're here with us right now, uh, you can change at the top. It says speaker view, but it also says grid view. So you can see everybody's face. I like to have it on grid view and see everyone's face. Um, and then you can also, the chat is down here. Yeah, I like this. Jesus is polling you in chat. Is it breakfast burritos or breakfast tacos? I know it is. It really does matter where you live. In San Angelo, Texas, it's burritos, not tacos. In Austin, it's tacos. So in San Antonio, it's puffy tacos. But I'm getting to, uh, this is the late Colleen, Colleen problem. Um, and uh, on the very bottom, there is, I actually don't think there's anything on the bottom you guys have to worry about. So um, you are welcome to put your questions in chat. In fact, I made this beautiful slide, so I'm going to share it. Um, this beautiful slide about sharing your questions in, in chat, but also if you uh, want to share links, please do that. Please talk to people. Uh, we love all this stuff in chat. And tomorrow, uh, I will have this recording embedded in a blog post. I will also have all the resources mentioned in a blog post um, and we'll be able to have everything. And because this, I think this is so awesome because as soon as the pandemic started, uh, I asked this question, could we just ship Makey Makeys to people's houses? And I didn't really think it would happen or know if it was, or if people would want that, right? Like if people are gonna wanna do it. And, but it's lasted long enough that we figured it out and we are for the rest of this month and September, if you buy Makey Makey kits, we will ship them to your students' houses at no cost, like no shipping costs. No, so all you're doing is paying for the Makey Makey and we'll ship it to like 30 different kids. We're totally fine with that. Um, and I think that's really exciting. And um, I've been working this entire pandemic on ideas for Makey Makey at home. And we, this whole panel is gonna talk about a lot more than Makey Makey. So all of you came for Makey Makey stuff. I'm telling it to you right now. Um, I've been building these classes that you can actually take virtually uh, with your students. You can share everything. And I've made them all with video and photo and text. And I'm working on a facilitator's guide if you wanna do synchronous and asynchronous. And now I'm working on taking the classes and making them a Google slide. So you can put them in your Google Classroom um, you can, so all these are clickable, right? You can go try out a virtual Makey Makey on Scratch. You can hear about from Jay Silver about invention literacy, or you can go take the class on uh, crafting a circuit. I'm going to make these for all those online classes you just saw in the PDF before that. And that is all I'm going to tell you right now. And I want to talk to see all these beautiful faces that we have. So in my bulb, I'm going to go who's directly to my left, which is Gerald. And Gerald is a principal, which I'm I just get excited when principals come to PD, like, because it's a small percentage of what you normally get of everyone's like 90% teachers, you get one principal. So it's really exciting to have you here. Um, you are a big agency by design fan. You're super positive guy. I was really had fun talking to you the other day. And I really like your gardening that you're putting out on Twitter for your students. So I just wanted you to uh, tell us a little bit about your school, because did your school start this week? So, uh, no, we haven't started Teacher okay. Start this week. Um, but hi, everyone. I am Gerald, as Colleen said. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am a principal, and my trade in education before becoming a principal is a science teacher. So I've actually been a teacher at St. Thomas More Catholic Academy. Um, we're a school located right in Washington, D.C. Um, we're pre-K-3 to 8th grade school. And for me, it's really, really important to bring in making and my love of science, especially for the kids. So I'm happy to be here to share things we've done and to learn from everyone here on the panel. Yeah, it's really cool to have you here. Um, and then below you is Kimberly and Brett, wait, Kimberly and Bradley, <laughs> hard to do. And everyone may not have known because I think you all fooled me for a few years, but they are married. So they got to share the same screen today. 
they're not breaking any quarantine rules right now. So uh, Kim and Bradley are actually stem pack winners. I kind of forgot that one time you guys won a full stem pack. Uh, you're both Mickey Mickey ambassadors and you both are such scratch advocates that you ran, helped run or facilitate getting unstuck this summer with getting unstuck with scratch. So uh, just tell us a little bit about each of your schools, just a little to say hello. All right, I'll go first. Um, so my school, uh, we've got about uh, 600-ish students, pre-K through five. Um, I teach STEM lab, so I see everybody uh, pre-K through five. Um, we work on a two-week block schedule, which is really great for creating projects because I see the kids every day for two weeks straight, which is it just makes it so much easier to do projects. And I really like that position because I get to do pretty much whatever I want. Um, there's no like set curriculum. So I invent all the curriculum. We invent all the curriculum. Um, and it lets, uh, you know, lets me bring in all the different subject areas. And that, that's like, for me, that's the best part is getting to bring in you know, the literature and the math and the social studies and the history and the science and like put it all together and let students see how those are connected in a, you know, kind of authentic way. How they, and they give them the chance to like play with those things rather than like, you know, a lot of times they experience it in class as a, like it's math time and it's like kind of like a little knowledge zoo where it's math and then it's science and then it's reading. And in my class, we get to kind of put it all together, which is really a lot of fun. Um, my school, um, we have uh, just under 1,300 kids. We're 100% Title I, uh, more than 90% LAP, uh, large refugee and new arrival community. And um, my principal has given me a tremendous amount of autonomy because I, I also I coordinate all our special projects. I'm our GT coordinator. I do our green schools programming. I um, do our UIL and basically anything that that falls outside the normal classroom, but is part of school. And um, what's really important for me is um, empowering my kids through project-based learning. Okay, we're both National Ge Net Geo educators and uh, really big believers in that sort of experiential action project-based learning. So everything that happens in my lab is usually tied into a green schools program. Um, so most of my kids' projects uh, work around one of our environmental initiatives because you know that's, that is an era, era that's real world problems where we've actually seen a tremendous amount of impact from student created and initiated projects. Uh, most of the recycling programs in the United States initiated through student projects way wow. back when. So, you know, it's, it's a chance for kids to use what they're learning academically and what they can make and do in my classroom to have a real world impact that they can actually see around them in our, in our neighborhood, on our campus, in their community. Cool. And Jesus Huerta is here below me and he is a fifth grade teacher who's now a sixth grade teacher. You teach everything, right? You're like an all, uh, I forget what they call that, but you teach all the things. Yeah, it's still elementary though in, yeah. in California because my, like my daughter started sixth grade today. It's middle school. So she did, you know, four classes today. She has four classes tomorrow, but you're all, all in, I want you to tell your story about your school and your students. Just you, that, that was, that's a great way to introduce you, I think. So I'm a, going to be a sixth grade teacher we start we start Monday um so I'm looping with my fifth graders which is awesome I've always wanted to do that um I'm a big believer in technology in the classroom not because oh look a tech toy it's it's the future mm -hmm. um my big thing is I, I do love making make you know that I, I do incorporate it but I'm also a big uh, believer in 3d printing um it's it's huge. And right now they just, I think it's in Denmark. They 3D printed a two-story house in like three days. Oh. And it's, it passed everything with flying colors. So, you know, and here in the States, I think in where they have South by Southwest, they have one that was 3D printed in 24 hours and it cost like $3,000 to print. That's here. That's here. 
This is where they have South by Southwest. That, there you go. So it's standing there now. Um, but to me, you know, the other reason that I, I push it hard where I'm at is um, where I live is not just hot, like we were talking about earlier, but it's, a, it's an area with a lot of um, challenges economically. Um, out here, there's a lot of migrant workers, field workers. My dad was a field worker. That's how my family ended up out here. And, um, you know, you see these other schools that are a little more affluent. They have those things. So why can't we push them, you know? And um, just to kind of share, you know, here's my little pen holder that I 3D printed. My wife didn't want it as a plant holder. It's an orc. Um, but, you know, I, I show my students that. We start with, like, I give them something when they show up. And then they move on to things like this. This is a working prosthetic. You can't see it because of my green screen, but this part yeah. is supposed to be green. Um, and then Colleen, the, the project I had talked to you about, um, yeah, it's gonna happen. So I, I, if you want, I can share that later. Um, yeah, I definitely want you to talk about it. Well, I have it, uh, I have it on a question coming up, so. But yeah, that's me. Um, I, I teach every subject, but I incorporate whatever I can get my hands on, you know, whether it's, you know, Arduino, you know, Makey Makey, VR, and definitely, like uh, Kimberly mentioned, design thinking and project-based learning. Um, e even with current events, when the Australia fires happened, my class asked more about it, so I turned it into a project. And they invented cool. little items and robots, and they had all these ideas on how they would help it recover or help it stop it from happening. And it nice. was all And just a side note for anybody that's in California, you might have it out there too. This was a group of ELD students, and I had the low students. Um, and they thought, oh, we can't do projects in here, right? And I was like, no, you're going to, and I'm going to challenge you. And they're the ones that came up with these incredible ideas. So just any teacher that's out there, even if you have allegedly the low kids, they're not. They just need an yeah. opportunity. I think um, ELD is that English language. What does development. D stand for? Development. Um, I think that that's really a, uh, and we talked about that a little bit last webinar too. I think that's really like a sad thing that people think, um, regular kids and kids who might be seen as uh i don't know what right word to use right now but i think everyone knows where i'm getting at um everyone is good at these things and i know when i did maker spaces in the library maker space in the library the classroom anything the most engaged kids were my usually least engaged kids so that students who were normally low performing would do the most amazing things when you gave them the opportunity and I think that's um, I think that's something really awesome we need to think about. Um, Gerald, when last spring, when you guys uh, were going through not being at school, you were already doing some pretty innovative things. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and a little bit about what you're thinking for this fall. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm a big proponent of making um, and using any and everything that you have. Um, so we have been doing a lot of the things coming out of the um, agency by design from Harvard University with making, looking closely, exploring complexities and finding the opportunity to make things better. Um, so our students or our scholars have really been focused on how they can look at systems and redesign them, not just in science class, but how can we look at complex systems in social studies and how can we use art to really facilitate our learning. And so last year I had the opportunity, I guess this principal comes a little bit of power, not a lot, but I got to be in the classroom. Um, and so I taught art and got the opportunity or had the opportunity to really pull in a lot of these skill sets uh, with our students and create these magical things that matter to them. And Colleen mentioned it. I, oftentimes I found my kids that were usually disengaged from the traditional education system when we gave them the space to really be like oh let's make something or let's you know what hey here's this thing to take apart um last year we had our eighth graders where we were throwing things out old desks yeah, or old pianos and they were like oh can we break them well no let's take them apart and let, let's see the complexities that are there and there's so much learning that takes place from just unscrewing things whether mm -hmm. it's getting the the hand eye coordination but the, the, the things that they see underneath the hood of a laptop and their eyes open up. And so we really have thought about how do we bring that into a virtual space? Um, and then how do we make them understand that making can happen anywhere? It doesn't have to be this dedicated space with thousand dollar equipment. We can use cups and popsicle sticks and we can create something magical. So we've been really flourishing throughout the summer to figure out what's the best practices yeah, let's get everyone a makey-makey, but also let's remember that 
we can give them some dollar store stuff too that they can mm -hmm. do some things as well yeah I, totally and i i actually i'm looking at the agency by design framework because it keeps i think it's something everyone may not know about uh the exploring complexities and finding opportunities and looking closely and i think you told me about a nature walk or something that i just thought sounded really fun uh, that you did with your students. And that was like last spring where you were bringing science into your home. And maybe that's really where I was thinking about was part of that question of like, your home is school. How are you? What are some ways you can take advantage of that? Yeah, so um, I'm a, a big proponent of social media. I know it can be used in bad ways, but um, I follow this, um, this woman and she's, and she's an artist and she is a big time artist with home design and everything, but she, creates these floral portraits of herself. And so I thought, okay, how awesome would it be if I had my kids in art create a portrait of themselves? Traditionally portraits are you find a picture of yourself, you take color pencils, you make that, that portrait. What we did was, okay, let's go out on a nature walk. Go out on this nature walk, pick up objects, just bring objects that you find interesting, bring them back. Um, and we had our kids do that. They took about 15 to 20 minutes to find sticks, flowers, and even after a day of rain, they actually went out and cut cut flowers off of or off of branches, and they came back. and Their challenge was to create their floral portrait, and these amazing things happened. They're somewhere on my whole Twitter line um, there, where they created these beautiful things. And kids that again are oftentimes marginalized or overlooked were the ones that really shocked me the most. And it really opened my eyes as a principal to say, what are we doing? Not necessarily wrong, but not intentionally when we're curating our lessons in school. Mm -hmm aren't flourishing this way within the school building. So now we're looking at ways that we can continue to use the backyard or we can use the bags that mom's about to throw away or those mini Amazon boxes that we have to trash. How can we use those in really creative ways? And it started just from a full portrait of themselves. And yeah, I, I watched the agency by design link. So if anyone yeah. wants to. And I, I love that story about the portraits. I actually, just yesterday, it w I went to another webinar and Netris, oh, now I can't remember her last name, but she works with Leslie Steam Un University. And I'll go ahead and add that in here too. She made an instructable for summer camp where uh, people were quilting. They were doing paper quilts, and but like it was painting. And I don't know why, but you're bringing a connection to that that I really think we could put all together. So I'll put that in the blog post. Uh, that is really beautiful. Your nature talk makes me think of Kim's um, ideas for connecting families and communities with gardening. Um, and she asked, you're already doing it. You're already doing it, Kimberly. When I talked to you, you were talking about doing it. Now you're already doing it. I saw it on your Twitter line. So uh, tell us about that. Um, well, we are one of the few National Wildlife Federation green flag schools in Texas. We've won our second green flag. And so it's based on all these student led initiatives. So I break it down. So each grade level has like their area. Our kindergarten are the uh, green heroes. They're the literalist ambassadors. They do the campus cleanup and collect uh, garbage and then they weigh it and sort it and create uh, anti-littering messages out of the trash <laughs> and posters. They film um, little commercials, our first graders of the Monarch Heroes. When they, if you're at all familiar with Houston, it's a city permanently under construction, which means we're tearing everything down all the time. And when we, they built a new school on my campus, we were on campus because we have a lot of land at our school. Uh, our kids couldn't go outside for three years because of the construction project on the campus. And then when they finished, in traditional Houston manner, they cleared the construction site by plowing all the debris into the earth. <laughs> so um, my fourth graders, I was a classroom teacher at that time, after our second year not being able to go outside, it was like, okay, this is ridiculous. I got them big heavy duty gloves and we went outside and we cleared the debris. And my daughter put the very first garden, the first living things on the campus as her Girl Scout Silver Award. And so ever since then, our Monarch Heroes, the first graders, they fundraise, they learn about the Monarch butterflies all year. They've installed almost, what are we up to? 350 square feet of, <laughs> like, I think it's almost 500 square feet of habitat, all native, all whatever. So the kids do all of this. 
And uh, so they've been missing it. I post a weekly video about our garden maintenance, trying to keep it alive while they're not there, and came up with the idea for family garden parties, P A R T Y, because I integrate art into everything that we do. And because I'm also the arts liaison at our campus. So um, there's always art making, and our big annual party is this big Earth Day event, which is a garden party where each grade level presents their gift to the campus of the artwork that they're, they've made always made out of garbage with whatever we find laying around. They didn't get to do it this year. So I invited the families up, family garden parties, and they are coming up and doing the projects that I had for the kids. And so, yeah, they are, they're not as, as intense as the, the things that the kids were going to be doing. But yeah, one of the things that we're doing is they're sponge painting all the uh, light fixture bollards. And then uh, we have all these A-frames that we've built out of pallets, leftover pallets that we find lying around all over the city. And they sponge paint those or they um, paint, yeah, uh, create, um, this is actually Brad's having to do the concrete in this bottom thing. Oh. We, we normally make these big garlands out of uh, plastic bottles that we collect during our campus pickup. And uh, we couldn't do that. And I'm having to purge my classroom of every single thing. Oh no, there goes all my accumulated garbage that we make everything out of. Um, mm -hmm. So I took all my plastic bottles and we uh, filled the bottom halves with quickrete to make little mm -hmm. flowers because you know, it's like a little flower image on the bottom of a water bottle. Nice. And so the kids are painting those to put on the, the pathways. So yeah, it's, a lot but the families have been coming up uh in the morning and on the weekends and getting to participate in the activities that the kids were supposed to do it's not right. all getting done but at least some of it's getting done but i like that you're involving your you're involving the families and the schools in houston have delayed start they're not coming till after labor day which is strange for us in texas yeah, everybody um, we're usually in school right now because <laughs> because it's hot and so we put kids in the air-conditioned buildings in august um so uh yeah. jesus i think that kind of ties with the sparks curriculum you were telling me about and the summer curriculum you talked about when so we when we talked the the one with the books um mm -hmm. so yeah during the summer um we still wanted to do after school enrichment um we have a program called sparks but it's it's same thing as aces um what they did is they partnered up with a company called After School Unlimited. So we had this curriculum where each day the kids would read a picture book, um, but they all had a really great message like Ish, um, oh, um, I Am Human. There was another one, um, Ada Twist. Is it Ada Twist Scientist? Yeah, that one. Um, so what I did was I developed like um, enrichment activities that went with it. So for um, Iggy Peck Architect, I found a digital um, it's like a toy box, but you could build like a little city and you can build like buildings and you just had simple shapes. Um, not exactly Minecraft, but exact, but I mean, it would work on what we have, which are our Chromebooks. And I tried to go digital and something physical. That way, you know what, the kids weren't just burned out of being on the screen, but they also got to use the devices they had at home. So they could see both. Um, and it's something we're going to continue now into the fall. Um, we're going to continue using those types of books and, um, what we're going to do is do kind of like a buffet style. The kids are going to see video pitches from each of the instructors, myself included, and they'll go click on these videos that we have and then they'll pick. I want to start with that one. Every six weeks, they roll into another one. So then they can pick and choose. So I'll be leading one on 3D printing and one on um, voxels on video game design. Nice. I'm looking up Ada Twist Scientist from uh, one of my favorite awesome black book. owned bookstores because it's my friend, Kathy. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to, uh, I'm trying to be better at sharing not Amazon links. So uh, my friend, Kathy owns Brain Layer Books and she used to be a librarian. And there you go, there's Ada Twist Scientist for anyone who needed that book in the chat window. Um, great book. Bradley, you're, you usually see your kids, we're gonna move a little bit to in-school conversation now. So you usually see your kids every, every day for two weeks right um which is already a kind of probably a strange schedule for most people but i've i've heard of some pretty wild schedules for elementary school um so what are you doing this year since it's going to be virtual for y'all are what a month you have a month of virtual we have right six now, weeks of virtual 
like for sure six weeks now, right. depending on how it goes in the rest of the schools that open before us, however it goes with them, that may change what we're doing. Um, so like when we went virtual in the spring, um, because we're, me, my team, we're like, you know, ancillary, we're not classroom teachers. So like, we didn't get a lot of attention. <laughs> It was kind of like just you guys work something out and, and just you right. know support where you can and so we created our you know our our activities and for me i created a digital activity depending on you know based on grade level and then uh an unplugged type activity which was some sort of like making challenge and again it was kind of like you know tiered for grade levels um so that you know, I knew not every kid had a device. Like at my school, families are, most of the families are pretty well off, um, but it was not a guarantee that there was an extra device around for the kids to be using whenever they wanted. So um, we had like office hours type meetings where the kids could come and ask questions or share, just talk or hang out and visit or, you know, ask for support or ideas. And, you know, we had the, the digital version or a digital task, which was usually scratch code.org or scratch junior or something, and then some sort of making challenge. Um, but then, you know, we both sort of, sort of had this idea to start creating like supplemental versions. Hers were more part of her classroom work for her students. I was doing them as like extra support for families and they were all totally unplugged. Um, in, you know, I think there we put links to some of the stuff on our slide that we sent you. Oh, um, let me but put it up. Has, okay. um, but they were they were some of them were like you know riffed off what the uh, tinkering studio at the exploratorium mm -hmm. were doing. Um, some of them were based on uh, the math art challenge hashtag that um, Annie Perkins created. Um, some of them were just like you know adapted from this that and the other thing. But um, we're all, the idea was to give the kids something like to make and to do, preferably with a family member or family members. So like as a, as a whole family making type activity. And then to, you know, not assume that they had any stuff at home. Because that's like with our students, you sometimes don't know what they've got available at home. You know, you can't count on them to have a lot of fancy just about anything. So everything was like purposely made and the, 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 the designs and like the step-by-step -step directions we created for them were all very simple, common stuff they might have around takeout containers and pencils and, you know, some scissors and the flashlight on your mom's cell phone or everything was designed to be as like broadly accessible as possible. And then as we go forward into this coming year, um, going to kind of be working along that those same lines where there will be, you know, some digital element that, you know, hopefully everybody's got some kind of device they can actually use at home. HISD is not there yet. So I, you know, I can't count on that. So there'll be the digital version, but then there will also be an unplugged a maker thing that again, doesn't assume that they've got anything special at home. Yeah. I know we talked a lot about that. In fact, I think everyone I called, we talked about um, equity and how we're going to do this crazy thing. And so I do see that you have some micro bit kits here, Mickey Mickey kits here that you're, you are planning on sending home. Um, and we might talk, let's talk about that a little bit. And then um, just because I already have your slide up and it looks so nice. And let's, let's talk about that. How are you? Because I think you guys said like, you're going to have to be okay with not getting it back, which I think is, yeah. It's kind of the thing that's like most teachers, because I already had a teacher tell, ask me, what what can I do for virtual makey makey stuff? And I'm like, well, you can send the kid home. And she's like, well, we may not get it back. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And I did build a virtual makey makey, but it just seems to make more sense to have a, to be able it, to get it to the kid. really hard because they took uh, all our residual bus budget when we went home. Uh, the district, and then they've already taken half of all the school's budgets away from them for this year. So I know mm -hmm. that anything I lose, there is zero guarantee of my having any way to replace it later. 
Um, but what are they for? You know, this is uh, at my school, we handed out over 600 of our iPads and, um, you know, you don't know if they're coming back. You don't know what condition they're coming back in, but there's no point in our having them if our kids don't have any way to connect with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Our real problem has been um, internet access, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots. It's been impossible to get. Um, you know, we, we have lost all... the internet today. During yeah. All, when everyone was in school, we all, we, it didn't, it was a no. <laughs> it didn't yeah. happen. So, you know, even, and that's even in places where people have it and can't afford it. So, you know, that's, that's an access thing. So when we passed all these out, we gave one device per family is all we could guarantee. And, um, you know, that's impossible. What if you have five kids? We have families with five or six kids at our school. How are they getting to all these classes? Yeah. And so, which is why the unplugged thing. And like you said, you know, when I'm in school, I will have kids come to my room and it's just like, I need to make a project for English. Can I have some scissors? So again, everything we designed was designed with the idea that what is in every house? A right. cereal. So everything is literally made out of toilet paper tubes and cereal boxes. And you don't even have to cut them. You can tear them. I mean, we found ways to make projects that were as bare bones as humanly possible. So before That's I check out these kids, I'm going to be doing the, like, I'm having the family garden parties. I'm having the family, um, I'm having maker family parties. maker parties. Nice. And so you can come to this school. My principal's letting me, um, so set up four tables, wild, widely separated, and everything will be sitting out and uh, with QR codes to scan for the, the directions. And so they can sit there and create and get familiar with the object and then they can take it home. And I already have permission. And most of the stuff that we're sending home is stuff that belongs to us that we've either won or earned through grants or whatever. We're starting with our stuff first and then, but I have permission to send the school stuff home too. So they check out the kit and we're using, among other things, the pages that you have <laughs> printed out. If anyone's familiar with Amanda Hawes, her stuff is fantastic. Um, so just one printed sheet, simple directions, QR codes that link straight to the activity. You get the device. Um, so things that we're going to be sending home, uh, micro bits, makey makeys. Uh, I'm even sending home some of my precious, precious bee bots for my younger kids. Um, we're going to be sending home uh, raspberry pies. And what were some of the other things we had talked about? Did we talk Did about how you're sending those home? Yeah, um, on one of the slides, it has a little picture. We have those little oh. photo box things for most oh, of Oh, no, them. I don't mean that. I mean, like, how is it getting oh, to the house? Uh, yeah. We're going to, like, a sign up genius type thing where the, they would sign up for a time to be, Couldn't and we would just meet them at school. We don't live all that far from our schools so like going up there the in the morning stuff, yeah. or you know later in the afternoon evening when parents are available mm -hmm. getting up there and just you know pulling up out front and i don't know like i don't know shady like, shady back of the car business dealings <laughs> are you gonna do it are you gonna do it curbside curbside like um and partner with your librarian and put a checkout code and yeah, we don't have librarians. <laughs> oh, I'm so sad. Yeah. My heart just bummer. broke. But um, uh, we, we, we step into that role as, as much as we can. Um, but just, yeah, meeting, you know, meet the, create, set aside an hour and everybody's got their little time slot to pull up and mask up yeah. and, okay, yeah. here you go. I'll meet you back here, you know, in a week or five days or whatever. And then we'll take things and spritz them with, you know, 90% rubbing alcohol and, you know, send it back out into the world. Tip and, and if we can find the rubbing alcohol is the other thing. And has anybody seen rubbing alcohol in months? Yeah. I found one little bottle. So. so, so just because people are asking in chat and that's like a thing, I do have a whole blog post about cleaning, makey makeys and cleaning. Um, it should actually work for Arduino boards and microbit too. It's just the amount of, that's the other thing you do have to have like the 90% rubbing alcohol to clean them a, a microcomputer or a microcontroller because otherwise you'll damage the board. So don't douse it, don't dip it, 
don't do any of those things just so I can say, where can you find it? I don't know. I actually found it from my neighbor who had some, but they should have it at the, actually at the grocery store. They should, but right now they don't because it's been sold out for COVID. months. Maybe right, right, right. Um, Everything's sold out. Swimming it. pools. <laughs> I'm sorry. Bicycles, apparently, too. Um, my my I, wife on Facebook, she's part of a group that just popped up back in March that they'll post, hey, you're looking for, you know, essential items like masks, cleaning supplies. Yeah. They'll post it and say, oh, they're having a Costco right now. And they'll take a picture of like a pallet. Nice. You know, so that, that's a, if, if you're looking for some of that stuff, look on Facebook for these weird groups. I, I say that's weird actually really, that's a good friend. advice. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jesus, I wanted to talk to you about 3D printing because we, he has the craziest idea that's so awesome that yeah. I think will be really cool because you are looping with your kids. So we have to all keep that in mind. But yeah. you have so, a lot of 3D printers, but you have, go ahead. Yeah, you go. You tell us. <laughs> so, um, right here at my house, I have six printers. Um, my wife is already going crazy. Um, and it's funny because I brought them from the classroom, but those five are like my personal ones. And then I have another one in the in the classroom from the district. Um, so, you know, the kids have access to it. You know, fifth grade, they were with me. They learned how to design, how to slice, how to run the printers, how to remove everything. But um, it, back in March of 2019, um, I was up for an award and I, I won it. I'm very proud of myself that, that for this right here, my, my prosthetic hand. Uh, my <laughs> creators actually, they printed all this and they built it and you can't really see it, but it's funny. They had a hard time with the knots. Oh, and I'm like, well, yeah. imagine you're playing your shoes and then they started laughing. They're like, oh yeah. Um, but my idea was to bring, you know, the, the contest was a thousand dollars. What could you do with it? And it was, well, we can make 10 of those prosthetics. And if you have 30 students, three of them, you know, work together, you give them a hypothetical situation of a person, but, you know, we're really making different sizes. We're going to send them out to a group like Enable. That's a group that can find someone in need and they'll send them the right size one. So the kids wouldn't know that they're making it for somebody that's going to get it. Hopefully everything works out. They get a mystery Skype call, but it's the person that they made the prosthetic for. A few road bumps, um, you know, I talked to you about that, Colleen. So then I ended up at a different district where I landed there. They're like, we have a MacBook program. We're going to put MacBooks in kids' hands and they're going to take it home. And we're talking about this last September, which would sound crazy now, you know, crazy back then, but now it's like the norm. Hey, everybody should take their devices home. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short, we had ordered 30 printers because we were going to put a print farm in my classroom. So then after school enrichment could use it my students would have access during the day also. I was gonna you know, try to bring along these, some of my students too. Um, but for right now, you know, they were gonna sit in the storage till who knows when, because we're a hot spot. Imperial County is one of the hot spots in California. It's like bad out here for COVID. So I talked to the director of ACES and she's like, yeah, they're gonna sit there maybe till next September. She goes, cause let's say everything calms down in May we're gonna take them out in May. I'm like, yeah, I go, I have a different idea. So Colleen, you're right, this is kind of a crazy idea. But I told her, what if we have the kids take them home? Because they're kits that the kids can build. Mm -hmm. And before anybody says, well, how much? thousand dollars. Every time I show printers, I've had I told I have parent told me ten thousand dollars. And I was like, that's not far fetched because I've seen ten thousand dollar printers. These are $189. Wow. Um the plastic, you get a roll, you can print like five hundred of these or what is this printer called again? It's the Ender 3. I can put a link to it in the in the chat if you want. Yeah. Um, so, um, long story short, um, everything's good to go. The ACES department is going to have them nice and clean. One at a time, they're going to have to schedule it out where they're not there at the same time. The kids are going to pick it up and through Zoom, they're going to build it with me. They can it's print so as cool. much as they want. Um, material's not expensive. It's about $20. Um, but it's, it, it, it's a project I've been wanting to do for about three or four years. And now I mean, we're going to- You had really good challenge ideas. You had some really good challenge ideas you were talking well, about. Well, and it goes back to what, what everybody has said, specifically, Gerald, you, you were mentioning taking apart. I love how you said, not break, take apart. So these kits, they're more complicated than the $400 um, bigger cousin of it. Um, but these are not small, like, eh, they're whatever. Print these are workhorse printers. I mean, I have one yeah. that been using for two years like nonstop, and i haven't replaced a part yet 
but they have to put all the nuts and bolts. They got to run the belt for the pulley to move it. So it's not an easy build, but they, they have me. I've built like 20 of them. So it's not a big deal. And I'm not trying to brag. You know, it's not me bragging. <laughs> um, but to me, the engineering part, the electrical engineering part, and then later on when they need to troubleshoot it, they're not going to go, what? I can tell yeah, them. Look, your they belt, built it. Your belt is, yeah, the belt's not loop right. Oh yeah, the belt. Do this. It's or really cool. If they're willing to, they can jump in and hopefully not tinker with it too much without asking. But the fact that they're going to have a printer there. So if I tell them we're going to do this design challenge, you have it. Yeah. Go for it. And but then you, you had some specific design challenges that all connected back to curriculum, which I thought was like, so nice. we, we do cardboard arcade. Somebody mentioned it. Um, mm -hmm. When they run into a roadblock, I don't tell them, even though the printers are in the back running and they always go, hey, can I look it up and print it? Yeah. And then everybody else goes, well, why didn't you say that? Well, you didn't ask. <laughs> you, you didn't ask. So there you go. Um, I, I One of them is fix my problem. Hey, uh -huh. I, one of my things is I always set my phone down somewhere. The kids are really nice about it. They don't mess with my phone. Or where's my marker? Where's my... So I always have them design something and they tell me it has to look cool because if you had an Etsy shop, you have to stand out. Um, and then they go, what's Etsy? So then I show them and they're oh, like, nice. I can make stuff and make money. I go, imagine if you're in college, you learn 3D printing now with me, you have a little side hustle, there you go. And then inevitably it goes into other things. But the big one is the prosthetics. But um, I show them like bio printing right now. They're, they're still in the testing phase for, they, they're testing retinas that are 3D printed wow. in, in sheep. So like if Gerald, I'm not picking on you, but you know, I know we're, we're having a little chat in the, in the, in the chat. Um, if you had cataracts right now, you look, you're about 30, you look about 30. So you're young, <laughs> I guess, right? Awesome. Um, they would take some of your blood, some of your skin for DNA, 3D print your retina and your body will accept it because it's like, oh, that's my eye. Because the language, the DNA is there, your blood is there. If you had a heart problem or say um, Bradley had a heart problem, what if the donor doesn't, you know, the, the, the heart doesn't, you know, it's not accepted by your body. Well, now this heart that's 3D printed, it's your heart. And that valve that you were born with that was damaged, we already fixed it. So now you're not going to die at 40. I'm not saying you're 40, sorry. Um, but you get to live longer or maybe at 65, you know, we'll put a new heart in you and now you'll live to 90. Now we're talking about, and the kids see this and the, the question they always ask, best question, where's everybody going to live? Uh -huh. They live to be 120. Little kids ask that question every year. They ask it when I talk about, well, now people can live to 120. And yeah. a child will always ask the smart questions that we won't ask. So I, I'll I put also, in that printer right now. Go ahead. I like how you talked about um, to, like using the 3D printer for the egg drop challenge. It's something we're all familiar about. So it's something that kids could do. Like they can design oh, yeah. a Tinkercad on at home and not even have a printer. You can still design it. And I know I talked, I think next week when we talked to Nathan Seconder, he was talking about they, they'll send him the files. He'll figure out a way to get them, like he'll print it and he'll get it to them. Because some, this is the way people can do it who have printers, maybe, is they can have the kids do things in Tinkercad and still get it printing. But you also talked about involving family and using design thinking and then having the kids design with household materials like mixed up with 3D printing. So I just thought. I got that idea. Here. I'm not going to lie. I got it from, um, it, it's called Iggy Peck Architect. Oh, yeah. And then there's yep. another one that where there's, she's an inventor and she builds a plane for her great grandma. Rosie Revere Engineer. Um, I was like, why can't we just build out a, I want to say junk. And then it made me yeah. remember, um, have you ever seen the Iron Giant? That old yes. person from the 90s? The art guy, he makes art out of junk, but I buy that stuff. And then, I mean, to go back to what you said, um, Mike, you know, you have those ear guards. I don't know if you guys have ever seen yeah. people three print ear guards. Um, my students made these. And I printed it Cute. here. I show it to them on camera, and they're still happy. that they, they, You know what they say? They say, pretty soon you're going to be able to hand it to me once everything passes. And then I cry when I hang up. Oh, it makes me feel no. special. Um, the printer be able there, to hug them. In the chat, and I don't work for them, but now it's one hundred and sixty nine dollars. They dropped oh. another twenty. How cool is that? I'm gonna and buy one and make my sixth grader put it together, and she's gonna join your class, Jesus. There you go. And if somebody buys one, um, if they find me on Twitter or you know some other way, calling if they reach out to you, I mean, I can guide them. Um, I can show them the video that I, I use to learn how to build it, or 
if yeah. they need ideas. I have my blog too. I can, I can put it in there also. Yeah, you should put your blog in chat. Um, I think this connects over to Gerald was talking to me about ways to connect everyday objects to different systems, which is another like it's kind of an IB thing. It sounds like the, the an IB idea, but I really liked your idea about it. You you talked about a fridge connecting to the system of a family. So if you could tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it came from out of Eden Learn, uh, which is another extension of Harvard University, and I'm getting the. I don't know if it's a protocol or a piece of the curriculum. I'm putting the link in the chat right now um, nice. where they talked about um, systems being a group of internet, interconnecting parts. And one of the things that we're trying to do at St. Thomas More is to get our kids sensitive to the design of systems. Um, you know, you Costco and we go to Costco and we shop at Costco, but it's a huge system, right? Mm -hmm. Moving parts of it. And so having kids understand that there's those everyday objects that are a part of bigger systems. And so we actually had our kids use the curriculum that I linked there and we each chose an object. Mine's was a fridge and each of the kids picked something else and how that connected to something, a, a bigger system. So how with the fridge, when you use this curriculum, there's a couple of questions that you have the opportunity to ask yourself. Well, when you look closely at it, how are they made? Um, how are fridges made? What were their purposes? Um, how have they changed over time? And then how might it connect in a big system? It's more than just this box that's cold that holds food, but family is a system. And that fridge plays a key part because it's a part of dinner time. And mom might go and make dinner from that fridge, but that fridge is one central point to that family dinner that we might have every single day. So nice. each of the kids got to pick an everyday object that mattered to them. And they followed and came up with their own questions. And then they got to pick their system. So we had some kids that picked watches and how the watch connected them to school or they used a notebook or the cell phone was a really, really big one um, for them in their everyday systems. And so I really think it's important for us to have our kids, even in a virtual space, look at things and how they're interacting and playing around with each other. And then as you get older, you can talk about the complex issues of COVID-19, which is a system. Mm -hmm. How does that play a role in the healthcare system and what are the pieces and parts and complexities of that. So I'm very excited to kind of guide my teachers around that, um, that we can look at these things that we kind of overlook a lot. Um, computers, yeah, were a big part of our, our life, but now we're learning, wait, I could have done all of this stuff that I was doing in the classroom virtually. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, and 10 times more. So um, that is a great resource to use. We're gonna be using it very soon um, with our kids taking apart um, other objects and looking at the parts and complexities of that. And then looking at how all of those things that are working on the inside of these objects, these pieces that make up this object, have a purpose that allows for that object to be a part of another system and a lot of things that it can do within there. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. I think that we also talked a lot about setting intention and how we were going to plan for what's live and not live. And, it, and we only have like 10 minutes left. So if everybody's probably can help answer this question, but I think, I, I mean, I saw it today in my first day of kids school, like we really need to set some intentions up first before we start what we need to see live and what we can drop those kids off to do um, asynchronous, you know, not live. So what, what are some, some ways to, to really get the best you think out of that short time where it's live versus just being talking at your kids for an hour and a half? Too hard of a question. I should have to add some wait time, huh? Are you muted? No, I think oh. as, a, um, as a principal, it's important and it's tough. If you're not a principal, you can't be like, oh, well, I'm not the principal. But as a principal, to show some grace, I definitely think is important in this world. Um, no one likes to sit at a computer, and I don't know how people do it, um, sit at a computer for more than an hour as an adult and not engage in either a conversation or in some making. So I think that it's important that when kids have four or six classes that they're going back to back, that pieces of that are maybe 20 minutes of live instruction, and then maybe we're going off camera to go on some scavenger hunt and bringing these things back. Or maybe um, I've seen some people do some amazing things where they're lowering the camera down, where we may be on there for an hour, but you're watching the hands of these kids work while they're nice. 
how awesome is that that yeah we spent an hour on screen but i was making that entire hour so that was cool so i think that um it's really important for us to think about how can we balance the two how can we get away from the screen um, whether it and provide some movement and then coming back on to to share yeah, I love the idea of getting a, a in fact, I'll, I'll share a link from Amos Blanton, uh, Lightning, Blanton. His real name is Blanton. I'm sorry, I got his Twitter handle and his real name confused, where he had put like a mirror up here uh, to help you kind of see down in your hands. And and I, I've been saying, I've been like, we've been trying to figure out the best way to 3D print this idea so that my, kin, my first grader can work on handwriting because she wants to type all day, but I don't want her typing. I want her writing right i want to see that um so yeah i think that's i think that's really important to figure out Do you, does anyone else want to add to that on, Pauline, on ideas? Um, i just wanted to add something in, in the chat i saw they were asking for a list of those books oh um, yeah I, I made a copy of the resource and i shared i shared them with gerald earlier um but i, I put a link there if Thank they you. click on that link i made an I, I made copies of it so that way you know what they can go in there look at all the slideshows I made over the summer. They have access to the resources. And I'm going to put a link to a website made for the summer school staff. And it has tutorials on some of the items they might see there. So if they're like, well, how do I use this program? Um, they can go to there. And also at the bottom, there's some extra stuff like that has to do with digital music creation. And uh, Oh, Jesus, you're not, you're not, you did to all panelists. I'm going to fix that. Not all panelists well, I, I, and attendees. I, 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 I meant it for everybody. It's fine. They can, yeah. They can. I know, but if it doesn't say oh, attendees, everyone can't see. see it. Okay. So some it's of those okay. links are for everybody. There you go. I'm going to put all the links that we have in the whole chat in a blog post tonight. That's my job. I was tech support cool. during the day for my children, and tonight this is. <laughs> I think it's about 25 books that we use. So they have access to that, and then they have a cool resource I think they can use with it. And then on the, on the, on the website that I made, um, if they scroll down to the bottom, like there's Chrome Music Lab, if they never used it. I love that. A few other tools they can use. And there's some other like art apps that they can use that are digital, just in case they have kids that they don't have access to anything, but they have the device at home. At least they can start doing something with them. Did you know that Chrome Music Lab, one of the people who did Chrome Music Lab is Eric Rosenbaum, who helped invent the Makey Makey. Yeah some some cross uh so i'm putting that link in there um and i see this parent someone says parents as teachers and so that really was my last question because uh i think bradley and kim talked about this with me specifically but i'm sure you all have answers of some ideas for setting up parents for success because i noticed today just uh from other parents i, I felt like i was helping other parents in the chat uh because i mean none of these tools are new to me so like it's fine but I can see this can be very overwhelming. So um, some ideas you have for setting up parents for success. The thing that uh, we're doing at our school is um, we've got a flip grid that is just like couple minute video cheat sheets, if you will, you know, uh, just a troubleshooting guide for all the different things that the kids are gonna be doing, all the different programs they're gonna be accessing, how to log in, how to submit lesson plans, where to find things. And then back to the previous thing about what has to be live is the first thing and that I make sure I go over with all the kids is where to find help and where to find answers. Before you set them free, it's like where are all the resources? So they need that before they go work on their own. And then a thing that we do is maintain office hours, times nice. when kids can jump in whenever there's a problem. And that had to be done because otherwise you're getting teams calls, not kidding, at midnight from second graders. <laughs> and I think you, I think Bradley talked about, um, about like live instruction on Monday and then you were doing office hours. Didn't you talk a little bit about that, that schedule yeah, idea? That, that kind of builds off of uh, what Gerald was saying is, you know, you know, the way my team and I have kind of like worked it out is, you know, Monday, that first day is, it's 15 or 20 minutes tops. It's, you know, a pre-recorded, like for me, like a pre-recorded little video step-by-step -step of what they're going to be working on during the week. And, you know, we'll all come in. I'll show that video because that's one of your help resources. I'll show them, they'll share the link so they can go back and watch it as many times as they need to. But like not more than like 15 or 20 minutes of getting started. And then it's like sign out of this team's call and go start making something. 
Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it is, you know, say a scratch project or it's a screen thing, you know, they're not just sitting there listening to me talk or watching me or listening to other people ask questions. It's, you know, here's what you're doing, go. And then I'm available if they're making something physical, it's like close your computer and go get your crayons and scissors and start chopping up cardboard or whatever you're doing. Um, but like doing as much like away from the screen as possible so that it's not, you know, cause I know that they're gonna be stuck in front of computers way more than they should be mm -hmm. listening to people talk and mm -hmm. watching little videos and being bored out of their tree and just you know i don't want to i don't want to add to that so it's like quick lesson introduction there's your resources go if you need help send me a chat in the teams or in you know whatever and you know i'll, I'll meet with you i'll talk with you as needed individually i'll check in with you midweek show me what you've got Okay, great. What you've got looks awesome. Go to work. Keep working. Go. See you Friday to share out. And you it's, know, it's I don't want to very, screen time. It's very different to um, have to listen to someone talk versus doing something with the screen on. So my uh, sixth grader today was like, oh, like I was fine, mom, that I was online all day because I was doing math. Like I was writing math and the screen was on, but I was doing math. So it didn't bother her as much. So I think those are kind of like important distinctions for teachers to think about too. Like we don't have to talk the whole time we're live. Um, I was doing, I also have been, I told you, I told this last webinar this, but I've been trying to do the makey makey classes I've made with my daughter and her friend virtually. And we, one thing I think that teachers are really gonna have to work on is silence is okay. Well, you don't have to hear your own voice for the 30 minutes you're live. You can show the kids something and then wait, just be here and wait. Um, because that's what, I had, that's what I did with her and her friend. And I will say troubleshooting from here to there is very difficult, but very rewarding. So um, it can be really fun. And then we did do the, every time we just do breakout rooms and I let them go do scratch afterwards. And and actually, our time is almost up. And someone did ask about virtual Makey Makey. So I'm going to give my last, because we didn't really talk about Makey Makey that much. And someone last webinar was a little sad about that, even though, you know, I think sometimes we got to do, we got to talk about all the things to be good at all the things. Um, I did make this virtual Makey Makey Sprite for your backpack. So if you are a scratcher and you just go to see inside, you can grab this Sprite and put it in your backpack. And then you will have that makey makey to work and it is already coded to light up. So that is a, a project you can then put in a, another project. So one idea that I have um, for my facilitator's guide is that if you are designing a scratch project with the idea of using makey makey, you don't have one yet, you can put the virtual one in your project. So here it's showing how I would plug it up. And then once I, then I have to actually code it. So, oh, he's already coded good. I shared the right one. <laughs> but this will actually show like how Makey Makey works with the actual tilt sensor that I have, right? But but I don't have to actually have a Makey Makey. It's just like, that's just, that's all I can do for you guys without sending you things that, you know, we have to, we have to make money sometimes. <laughs> so that's, that's the idea for me about virtual Makey Makey is that it's a little weird because it is strange to think, well, am I gonna, am I then gonna have bananas that I put in the scratch project? But like, what if you're building a sensor and it does something? Um, I did another project earlier with the door alarm. So it has, and I actually did get that for my sixth grader. She made um, a prototype in Jamboard instead of Scratch. So it doesn't always have to be Scratch. And then on Jamboard, Google Jamboard, she showed like the door opening and shutting and that would be the sensor opening and closing. So they're still learning about circuits. They're still doing all that stuff. And I think that's just like a, a really cool way to do it. Um, so it is 6.01. That means it's 7.01 in Gerald's time zone. I apologize, Gerald. <laughs> and you have school tomorrow. Yeah. No, but, you don't have school yet. You do have school, but not, yeah, but but not with kids. It's the life of a principal. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to work from like 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or something. I think that's your hours. That's the hours. <laughs> but this Thanks. is fun. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. It was really awesome. Um, I was really, I was really interested to um, see our friend in New Zealand, Melvin's 
uh, questions about the digital divide. It's kind to me, it's baffling. There are, there are countries that don't have this digital divide just because I've seen it um, I, where I've worked, I've always worked um, where it's been really obvious um, in the public schools that I've worked at. So anyway, it's great to see all of your faces. It's, this is a great way to be social. And even on the exhausting first day of school where mommy plays tech support, this was just awesome. And um, I will share the video and I will share all the links of all the things that everyone talked about. Um, yeah, you guys, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. It's really awesome. And I think there was even more stuff that you all have to share. So if everyone, I did put all the Twitter handles in here, if everyone would go and follow these amazing educators, you can find out more from them. And I think we're gonna be seeing more from you all anyway, because you're all so awesome um, and doing just really cool things. So it's really nice to, um, it's nice to share what you're doing. And I hope you have a good year. <laughs> I don't even know what to say anymore. But your, I hope your school year goes, you know, you're going to learn a lot. And um, Gerald, I think when we were talking, you said something like what we always need to be thinking is how can we take these experiences we learn from this time back to school when we do get to go back or even just right now, we're learning so much. So I know there are some people that kind of excited about this because they're being challenged in a way they've never been challenged. And you, you really get to try some things that you never thought you'd try, you know, like I, I started trying to teach virtually, even though, and I thought now I, I could offer to do the same thing with students in Australia or, you know, wherever, like, why, why haven't I ever just tried to do a virtual workshop? So I guess if you guys bug me via email, those of you who are panelists, you get priority. I'll come teach your classes. All right, so thanks everybody. You all want to unmute and say goodbye. Everyone want to hear your voices. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you. Meet you, Gerald. Right, this is. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.